All right, guys. Today we're gonna be reacting to giants of literature in a Nazi concentration camp. And Wittmer, good and evil sit side by side. Ooh. Again, one of my subscribers sent me this great video that I found in my Discord. Hey, one by one, we're gonna go, go through all of them. There's a lot of them that are kind of long. We're gonna save those for the weekend. Like I said before, but th those are, you know, okay when it comes down to time. We're gonna just react to them right away. So we're gonna just learn a little bit of here controversy, uh, controversial history. So let's see what's going on here. Let's jump in. At first glance, Weimar looks like a typical town in central Germany with Baroque facades, cobblestone streets, and renovated historic buildings. Yet Weimar is unique. Weimar. Welcome to Weimar. This path is one that's been walked by many before me, writers and artists, Republicans and National Socialists. Today, this seemingly Republican. idyllic town in Thuringia is known for its beauty and is a popular tourist hotspot. So are you ready to explore it with me? Then let's go. Yeah. There are a few other cities in Germany where a high culture and a sordid past lie so close together. Weimar represents mm. the heyday of the classical period. Its stars are the poets Johann Wolfgang von Goethe and Friedrich Schiller. Oh, look at this gentleman. I huh? have to get a selfie with Goethe and Schiller. The Bauhaus was also Respect. in Weimar, the school which revolutionized art, design and architecture at the beginning of the 20th century. But Weimar okay. is also associated with the terrors of the Nazis. They built Buchenwald, one of the largest concentration camps in Germany, near the center. Contradiction in Germany's soul between the enlightened heights of Goethe and the experimentalism of Bauhaus and some of the darkest moments in German history. So how does Weimar deal with this heritage? Well, that's hopefully what I'm going to find out today. Mm. Let's start in a very idyllic way. My first stop is the park on the Ilm. The park, so to speak. This is where the story of class. That WZ in the background, right? Ah, hopefully that doesn't give me a couple of Classical runs. Weimar <laughs> begins. Oh, that's so beautiful. what actually makes this park so special? How come it has world heritage status? Yeah, well, it was designed by Goethe and the Duke um, at the time. It's a park that is rather following nature than telling nature how it's supposed to be. True, it's letting nature yes. grow for itself yes. and building mm. around yeah. it. Yeah, so if the little river makes a curve, then the path will just follow the river. Yeah, I mean, it's a beautiful place. Even in the rain, we're still having a really nice time. Yeah, it's quite gorgeous. That really. is a good point. It looks beautiful in the, in the rain. Enlightenment period of the 18th century, Weimar attracted numerous artists. In 1776, the already yeah, wow. famous poet Johann Wolfgang Goethe moved into this house, which was given to him by Duke mm. Karl August. With the help of Goethe, August gradually turned this rather small residential town into a cultural stronghold. This little house actually has UNESCO World Heritage status. That's because it's Goethe's garden house, his first home in Weimar. I mean, I like how they keep the same structure, the same doors and everything. Mm. For six years, Johann Wolfgang Goethe lived and worked in this house until he later moved to a larger apartment in the center of Weimar. Very simple house, huh? So what brought Goethe to Weimar in the first place? Goethe had studied the law and he had a position um, as, yeah, well, at a, at a chamber, and, uh, but he was bored there. So he started writing because he really wanted attention. And he wrote mm. The Sorrows of a Young Werther, which became very popular because he kind of broke the rules in this book. He wrote very enthusiastically about emotions. And in the end, Werther, I don't know how familiar you are with it, but Werther kills himself. And suicide, what? of course, is a taboo. Ooh. Uh oh. So he killed himself with all that talent? Mm. And um, Wham book becomes a bestseller, obviously, right? And our young Duke, who was just 18 at the time, he read that and he was fascinated. And he uh, 
was wondering if he could meet the author and of course he was a duke so it was arranged and um, they talk and the duke realizes that Goethe is um, a person he likes he's young he's smart he's educated he's a lawyer right so and he decides to invite Goethe to Weimar and for the first couple of months they basically party but then the duke says okay I'm gonna put him to work and um, to make good in order to make uh, Goethe stay he gives him this house the garden house Mm -hmm. um, as a present and also um, the Duke offers Goethe a job in his cabinet so he wow. actually asks him to be a politician wow. and that at the time is still very rare because Goethe was not a nobleman mm -hmm. he was a commoner and um, a merchant's son and so the, this is the, the age of the Enlightenment right the Duke sees here yeah, as a smart a person and yeah no, back then we didn't they didn't have the economy or the concept of the economy that we have now, right? Uh, that to just have that kind of opportunity and just basically exploit the talent in itself, it's just a privilege. And I should make him useful for my purposes and for my duchy. And so he asked him to stay. Some of his poems and plays were written here in the garden house in the park on the Ilm River. Goethe worked at his writing desk on a seat like this one. Oh, wow. What is that? This one here is super short. Yes. Mm. This is one of the short messages that Goethe sent to his, yeah, beautiful well, his love. Um, I mean, Charlotte, she was married, so, mm -hmm. but he was really um, inflamed for her. So, um, <laughs> yeah. And uh, she lived really just across the river okay. and they used to send short messages I mean it's really like very much like the way we do today like wow. 160 like a tweet or something or text yeah and um, wow. then he would have the the, the messenger boy would uh, literally wait downstairs until he had answered and then he would send him again and then he would sit here and wait for the messenger boy to return to bring him an answer oh, before nightfall so man, that yeah. had to be the worst oh my goodness no wonder, no wonder, but that has to be the worst, folks. I'm sorry. It's uh, much more romantic oh, than sending yeah, a text. Absolutely. Oh, yeah, it is. <laughs> but I think more expensive, too, because you have to give something to the messenger boy. I mean, it's not exactly yeah. 20 cents, is it? Yeah. Well, <laughs> maybe it was the equivalent at the time, so. And now to the second <laughs> cultural achievement that Weimar is famous for. At the beginning of the 20th century, Walter Gropius founded the Bauhaus Design School here. This is the birthplace of Bauhaus. Everything that you touch from your iPhone to your sofa was influenced by the minds that met in this very building. Really? Okay. In the main building of the Bauhaus University Weimar, you'll find a Bauhaus style staircase. And the office of Walter Kopius, the founder of the Bauhaus. Who actually was Gropius? Walter Gropius was an architect and he was offered the post of um, headmaster at the Arts and Crafts School in 1915. But of course at that time it was the Great War so Gropius wasn't able to take up the position. And after the mm. war he comes back to Weimar or he writes to Weimar and says how about that job? Is that still available? And by that time okay, he so has together with right there. Very square, minimalist, right? Very minimalist. The, what they call the Swedish style. Colleagues, they have developed ideas um, how to reform the education for young architects or young artists. He combines the arts and crafts school and the school for fine arts, okay. and he forms a school that is based on workshops. So they work in the workshops in the morning, but in the afternoon it's the theory lessons that make all the difference. Those are taught by the most famous painters of the day, um, Lionel Feininger, Paul Klee, Vasily Kandinsky, it's the really big names, and they all come to Weimar because the idea of the one school where you can become a craftsman, an artist or an architect, that's appealing to everyone. What would you say mm. Bauhaus stands for? Um, it is very difficult, really. I mean, I said something already. The Bauhaus at that time as a school tries to develop prototypes mm -hmm. for new products, for new technologies. Yeah, so he probably uh, an inventor, you will say. 
that's what I'm getting. Like, he was an inventor trying to just put something out there, kind of a thing. So In its simplest form. In its simplest, yeah, well, form follows function. I mean, they're not the so first to say that, but this is what is really like important to them. And da Vinci was a great painter, but he was an engineer doing a lot of stuff for, for you know, for war, right? Stuff like that. So basically he was trying to put stuff in the wall, throwing stuff in the wall, hopefully something will stick. If you look at, for example, That's the chair getting. or the desk, it okay. is really very simple and simple, functioning yeah. is the main thing. It's not about design necessarily. It's about nope. being practical, being affordable um, f to a, a you know, like a, a wider, um, group of people, not too expensive, and uh, being durable. This is after all the time, after the First World War, materials are rare and people have to, you know, be thrifty and um, not spend oh, so that. much. So they also try to reduce the material. Um, they don't add any ornaments, ornaments if they're not necessary because uh, it would be a waste of material. Good point. All right, now it's time for the last and admittedly most difficult part of my trip to Weimar. Just outside the city center is the Buchenwald Memorial. Uh oh, this is it. This is the it concentration camp operated for almost eight years until its liberation in April 1945. A total of 266,000 people were imprisoned here. It's so quiet here already. It already feels like we're stepping into a different world. Spirit. Although Buchenwald wasn't an extermination. I don't know about you guys, but spirit and a lot of people say the same thing when they visit Gettysburg uh, when a lot of you know a lot of soldiers die for north and the south uh, that area is like uh, that cemetery it's Gettysburg is very different dense cold nation camp many prisoners were still murdered by the SS or died from the inhumane working and living conditions so this is where the barracks would have been. This is an, an example. So you see uh, the outline and they, the, all the barracks where the prisoners lived uh, in the camp were demolished, but they get kind of left markers for us. So they put up this um, coal wow. rubble here so we can see where the barracks were. Kind of as a memorial. Yes. Yes. Yeah, and I think also, so you can, when you visit the site, you can imagine yeah, what it looked like or better. try to imagine what it looked like. So, so a better visual um, yeah, impact, really. Mm -hmm. For me, one of the most right. haunting places in the memorial is the crematorium. It's estimated oh, that 56,000 people lost their lives in Buchenwald. Oh, yeah, this room certainly has a strange atmosphere to it. Yeah, so this is where the people were cremated. I mean, um, some were killed, some just died of exhaust or some had diseases. And uh, generally they were not very well nourished. And so a lot of people died. Oh my goodness, Laura. That is a crazy one. Mm. Right here. But you have to leave it right, yeah, you have to leave it there. You cannot hide it. That way people can learn from it. Uh, because also they had to work. Um, very hard and then they would be brought to this place and um, you can see how efficient um, they try to deal with this mass of dead bodies really. Um, they had these yep. carts um, on these rails so they would put the body up there and then they could push it into the oh, yeah, wow. into the oven and um, you also have these little pits down there so after you know everything was burned they could sweep out the ashes very efficiently. Cold, hard, Damn, German yeah. efficiency. I, 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 yeah, yeah, I was about to say that. German engineer right there in this play, even for the war. It's worst form. Kind of, yeah. And uh, the company who had built these ovens, uh, they actually, uh, so in the beginning when they started with the crematory, um, they had only four. And then they saw that the demand was very high. So they really worked and developed a better system. So they came up with uh, six. Um, you know, so you could burn six bodies simultaneously. And oh. um, yeah, what you just said, it's, it's German efficiency at its worst, really. Mm -hmm. Shortly it after the liberation is. of it the concentration camp, the Americans forced many Weimar residents to visit it. Buchenwald has been a memorial site since 1958. Last year, 250,000 people visited, confronting this dark part of German history. Mm -hmm. 
today, I really wonder, maybe you can even just tell me your personal opinion. How do you reckon with the kind of very contradictory past here? Um, I think it's very important to look at both sides. I always say Weimar is like a metal and it has this gold and shiny side with Goethe and Bauhaus and Bach and, you know, wonderful things. But the back is, in our case, it's really literally quite dark and, and black um, because we have support, started to support Hitler in 1925. And these 20 years have left so many traces all over town. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I'm a tour, tourist guide, so I can do a whole tour on that. And um, mm -hmm. I personally think it's very important to mention this, this Nazi time on every tour because it is part of our heritage and we cannot pretend it isn't. So we have. Hey, she had a good point, though. She Man, she's a nice tourist. She's she's a realist. She has a nice point, man. She's like, we should not pretend it doesn't exist. Bro, this is part of our her heritage. Hey, we have to own it. To kind of stand up to it. After all, we, you know, the young generations, we have a responsibility to prevent to things prevent like it. this from ever happening again. And this is what I also tell, uh, you know, the, the student groups that are coming. Uh, I know it's a very difficult topic and nobody really likes to... Um, yeah, learn about it because it's, it's quite horrible. Yes. Uh, but we have to learn about it, we have to know about it so we can, um, yeah, judge what is happening in our times right. and, and have an opinion about that. Yeah, yeah of mm -hmm. course. I didn't want to interrupt you, just but Sorry. I think that to be aware of the past in all of its elements means that you can still really appreciate all of the light and all of the good things because yeah, she's you're right also too. accepting the terrible things that you happened. You have a ring in her nose. Don't, don't, don't be fooled because she has a ring in her nose. She had a you good can point. also appreciate all of the good things. The tension between the positive and negative aspects of history is found again and again in Weimar. Goethe himself stayed here at the venerable Hotel Elephant, but so did Adolf Hitler. He liked to stay here frequently. Wow. Now it's time to grab some food. Hey, Hi, hey, I'd love to try a typical Thuringian sausage. <laughs> All right, let's see if the famous Thuringian Bratwurst lives up to the hype. Yeah, that's pretty good. It's kind of spicy. It's good. Yep. It's a lot of people that of like course, it. Of course, there's no easy way to explain how Weimar reckons with its heritage. Perhaps the coexistence of high culture and Nazi history is actually a reason to look further into the town. Weimar doesn't try to cover up its past. In fact, it encourages visitors to learn about some of the darkest moments in German history. And it's a beautiful place to visit today. It's basically telling people, hey, man, we're good people, but don't mess with us. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Let me know what you guys think. This is very nice, man. I don't know. They have a good point, man. When it comes down to these kind of stuff, yeah, we cannot just simply brush it under the rug. We have to confront them. We have to confront them, and I think they have a good point. But let me know what you think in the com in the comment section. I really enjoyed this video. Send me more, more, videos, uh, more videos like this in the, in the Discord. I really appreciate that. In the meantime, guys, I'll see you in the next one.